So Jesus has this crowd assembled. What a great uh, venue, so to speak, right? To pick the mountain. He goes, goes up to this high mountain. Uh, I would imagine everybody, by the time they get there, innovated, you know. Um, probably tired and maybe sleepy. But Jesus is speaking. And you'll stay awake when Jesus speaks. So it will be a glory to hear him speak. So he saw the multitude and he went up into this mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him and then he began teaching the Beatitudes. So we've, we've already gone through a number of them, most of them. Uh, but now we have this uh, final Beatitude. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I don't know. We're living in America. How many of us have really been persecuted? Well, some people have, but not everybody. Usually, this is a pretty tame place. Nobody's been put to the stake. Nobody's been um, lifted up on the rack. We haven't faced any of that. Um, that might change. It could change very suddenly in America. It continues on here, you know, kind of an addendum to this is, blessed are ye, makes it very personal now, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So that's our consolation. You know, on Wednesday night's little advertisement for Wednesday night, but you know, we're in the 12th chapter. And in that 12th chapter begins, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. So the notion of that is uh, all that went before us are kind of in heaven in the grandstands, you know, cheering us on as we run our individual races. When we look back at the uh, history of the church and we look at what believers have gone through for 2,000 years, uh, truly uh, the, uh, the strength, the seed of the church is the blood of the saints. The church is established and has been established through the centuries by persecution. So, when men shall revile you, speak evil against you, you know, mock you for your faith, be glad, it says. Great is your reward in heaven. You know, there is the martyr's crown. There are five crowns that can be given out at the great Bema seat in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, uh, most people want to sign up for most of those crowns, but not too many people signing up for the martyr's crown. That means you have to give your life's blood, you know, be, and there are people as we speak who are dying for the cause of Jesus Christ. And we must remember them, even though it's somewhat foreign to us in America. But this has been, in fact, the uh, characteristic of the church from the very earliest and beginning days. So the Christians were accused of disloyalty to the fatherland, accused of atheism because they believed in the one and true God. The polytheists believed in a multiplicity of gods. So they considered them atheists. You reject the gods, plural. Hatred towards mankind of hidden crimes and of uh, incest, infanticide, and ritual cannibalism. This is what they thought was happening at the last, at the supper, at the uh, concept of eating the flesh of Christ. Likewise, they were held responsible for all natural calamities, such as plagues, floods, famines, and so on. Now, back in 2012, I did a study on the book of the Revelation, and in it, of course, the first three chapters are addressed to the churches of Asia, the seven churches in particular. And each one seems to be a characteristic of the epoch of the age. The second church is called the Church of Smyrna. And uh, I, I put out some charts on this so that it may be a little easier to understand the historicity of the matter. And so we had this period of time where you can kind of begin with uh, John being exiled to the Isle of Patmos, which was in a sense uh, Alcatraz of the first century. And he was there and he receives this beatific vision of the Lord and the revelation, he receives all that. But it was a time of persecution. And almost uh, might trail it back all the way to Paul in his beheading when Nero beheaded Paul. 
but it really uh, came into full force in the second century of Christianity. Uh, so John on the Isle of Patmos at 96 AD, and then you can go through there and you can see, I just put some of these concepts up here, the catacombs, you know, the believers in Rome had to actually go underground in, into a uh, uh, underground burial vaults, and that's where they would secretly hold services, whispering hymns and reading the scriptures uh, in fear of the Romans who would find them out and persecute them. Uh, and this went on, of course, for 200 years until finally we end up uh, to uh, what was considered the Edict of Persecution. I put also here secular history, which coincides with church history, so that we understand all of this, in fact, did happen. And under these uh, ruthless and uh, barbaric acts of the Caesars, 10 of whom are uh, in particular notoriety, starting with Nero and uh, ending with one named Diocletian in uh, 310 AD. He issues an edict of persecution and uh, makes uh, Christians fair game. You can kill them, uh, beat them, do whatever you need to do. Um, the proclamation was round up all scriptures any Bibles, burned them, and they were burned. Uh, one, one is shocked when, they look, when we look back and realize how many extant existing manuscripts survived that period of extinction. God's hand was upon this, obviously. So that was the period, the church at Smyrna. Uh, so uh, when I taught on this in 2012, I, I actually assembled a, uh, a video to help us understand something of the flavor of persecution in those first uh, 300 years of Christianity. So I want to go to that at this point, and then we'll get right back. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Persecution steadily intensified after Nero until it reached its fiendish climax in 303 AD with Diocletian's horrific edict of persecution. Bibles were confiscated and burned in public view. Believers were flushed out of their hiding places in the catacombs and fed to furious beasts for public enjoyment. They were mutilated by wild dogs and crucified and then set on fire to provide light for the pagan feasts. Yet, through the years of unbelievable barbarities, the church continued to proliferate. God raised up his faithful witnesses, such as Ignatius of Antioch, Papias of Hierapolis, Clement of Rome, and Polycarp, who was himself martyred at Smyrna. These, with thousands of others, sealed their testimonies with their life's blood and gave credible witness to that generation that there was a power that could transcend the worst torture Caesar could marshal against them. The empire had lost the furious war that they had waged against Christ and his church. The public spectacle of Christians facing the angry jaws of the beasts or the inexorable flames of the stake with unshakable peace, proclaim the power of the living Christ, a power that Rome so savagely sought to destroy. In the same Colosseum where the triumphant Olympic athletes were crowned with a laurel wreath, could now be seen the saints of Christ being rewarded with a martyr's crown. But the church triumphant was about to face a far more deceptive time of temptation. So there were martyrs uh, during those, that terrible, so to speak, the incipient 
days of the church. Church is just growing at that point. And the devil, of course, turns up the flame and uh, makes you pay a terrible price <clears throat> to be a Christian. You know, to some degree, when we look at the Laodicean lukewarm atmosphere of the church, modern church today, we certainly understand that it's because it costs nothing to be a Christian today. People take it or leave it. In the first century, you would, uh, your, your life was threatened to become a Christian, put a mark on you. Um, and of course, that means that your faith would have been a durable faith. So, <clears throat> Christian religion was proclaimed as strange and unlawful by senatorial degree in the year 35. And uh, 135, and deadly, according to Tacitus, wicked and unbridled, according to Plinius, new and harmful, according to Suetonius, mysterious and opposed to light, according to Octavius, and hateful again, according to Tacitus. Therefore, it was outlawed, persecuted because it was considered the most dangerous enemy of the power of Rome, which was based upon the ancient national religion and on the emperor's worship. Christians then were given the opportunity to either hail Caesar as the living deity and offer a sacrifice of incense to him or refuse to do so and admit that Christ alone is Lord and face as a result the inexorable jaws of the lion. Uh, that's what it was in the first three centuries of Christianity. It may become that again and I just want everybody to be on alert here that uh, though we have had this hiatus of liberties and freedoms, it may come to an end, especially with the hostility of the woke generation today that wants to muzzle people. Uh, they want to consider what we're saying here from this pulpit, hate speech, and as a result ought to be tried as a hate crime, all because we stand against the transsexual uh, revolution that's going on, the homosexual revolution and so on, and for that matter, abortion and uh, fornication, and we stand against sin. And when you stand against sin, we're, we have a mark on us as a result. And it's considered hate speech. Now you've heard me preach here for many weeks, months, years in some cases, some of you. And you know that uh, I'm outspoken and I, I do not ear tickle. I, I'm here to tell you what the truth is and what the Bible says. It's as clear as that. But that's considered hate speech. But it may get worse than that. The idea is they want to cancel us. Uh, and the world has always been at enmity with the truth. The world is no friend to the truth. And so when John writes his epistle in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is of the world and not of the Father, and the world passeth away in the fashion thereof. So, we have the notion of enmity. You know, I'm the enemy to the world, the world's an enemy to me. It was, I think, Hudson Taylor that wrote, the devil and me, we don't agree. I hate him, and he hates me. This cancel culture is uh, eerily like what was predicted by Orwell in 1984 the 1984 novel that was written right after World War II, where Orwell merely wrote it in 1948 and decided to reverse the numerals to 84 and predicted that we may see another dictator, a Hitlerian type dictator rising up. In the uh, novel he wrote, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong, and he was right. Are you feeling this today, beloved? And it's, it's a frustrating thing. The world has made wrong right, and everything that's right, wrong. So we're in opposition, intellectual, philosophical opposition with what the world is all about. So um, if you're going to follow Jesus, he said there'll be persecution. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer 
persecution. So Paul writes to Timothy, first century, and now 21 centuries later, it's certainly still true. In uh, my little video clip there, we use some excerpts from the uh, persecution of Christians when they were cast to the lion's den during uh, the Neronian uh, Empire. Christian martyrs were used as candles, torches, or lanterns to see by them, them at night. Of those who were burned, uh, some were tied or nailed to stakes and held still by a hook driven through the throat so that they could not move the head when the pitch, the wax, uh, tallow, and other inflammable substances were poured over their heads and set on fire. So they became votive candles to the pagan feasts. And that's how demented minds that live without the knowledge of God can become. Paul refers to them as beasts. If, uh, after, uh, after a manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage it me if the dead rise not? So he referred to them as bestial, humans that have no conscience, who can inflict pain w without even uh, any uh, tincture of remorse. And we think of what's going on uh, with abortions, so we're certainly glad that the Supreme Court finally said what everybody already knew, and that was that this is not a constitutional issue. And so they throw it out now. It's, you know, it's, uh, they, after all these years, since, since 1973, now it's thrown out. And it's given to the states. And our liberal governor, Shapiro, uh, will uh, permit abortions. It's okay here in Pennsylvania. You can, you can kill your babies. Now, what has happened to the conscience, the psyche of men? They've been told murder is right. They've been told that. They hear it so often, they are now so brainwashed by this that they believe that they're right in killing babies in their wombs. In fact, even after they come out of the womb, they are to be murdered if uh, they were somehow survived the abortion. They've uh, passed legislation to kill the baby anyway because it was supposed to die with the process of abortion. Um, so this is hellacious. That this is happening in a civilized culture, incredible to us. But a little later on, we're going to find out probably tonight, Jesus also said, and it was a stinging rebuke to us, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. We're the salt, the preserver. We preserve conscience in America because we hold to the standards of God's holy word. We say, this is right, this is wrong. And that's considered hate crime now. And they'll be coming for us, I'm sure, at some point because that's where all this is headed. Uh, unless God shows us a great reprieve. Amen. And unless the church of Christ becomes uh, savoring salt again, preserving the power of the conscience through the preaching of the gospel, we can still have revival. It can still happen, but it, not with the compromise that's going on these days. It was Paul that went through a litany of tortures and sufferings after he'd become a Christian. He said, are they ministers of Christ? Well, so am I. I speak as a fool. I'm more and labor is more abundant. And stripes, that would be flagellation, Roman whippings. 29 stripes or 39 stripes. Above measure in prisons, more frequent in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Um, of course, there, you might remember Derby and Lystra. He goes to heaven and he sees the Lord and God sends him back to earth and uh, finishes his, uh, his course. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, perils of water, and perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, perils uh, by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. False brethren. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold, in nakedness, uh, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me, uh, daily, the, the care of the, all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? 
Uh, so he certainly had been through his, uh, his many sufferings. In fact, at one point, right after he was saved, they had to let him down uh, in a basket over the wall because they wanted to grab him and kill him. So I call it a basket case at any rate. <laughs> so the cloak that I left at Troas and with Carpus, uh, he's writing from jail here to Timothy. I bring that with thee and the books, he said, but especially the parchments. He wanted the Old Testament scriptures. He said, bring the parchments. While he's in jail, he's going to read the Bible, right? Tell the guys at the jail, you know. I said, you're never going to have a time like this, perhaps ever again in your life. Don't be fooled and sit in front of and watch Oprah. Get in your cell and read the Bible. Read it from cover to cover. Put it in your heart. Memorize much of it. Uh, when you get out of this place, you'll now have the armor of God in full. And you can stand against this devil who's made a fool of you for all these years. He said, bring me the parchments. I'm in jail. I want to read the scriptures. Alexander the coppersmith, he did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also. For he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to the charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You know, commentators say, what was this about? This was, you know, this was prior to Nero feeding Christians to the lions. Was Paul, was this going to be a special case or... Or was he speaking about the devil, you know, the roaring lion that walketh about seeking and may devour? Um, well, nobody comes to any great conclusions on that. And so I'll be a politician. Both are true. Right? Both are true. So, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, and even Peter writes, uh, Similar time here now, we're, uh, we're beginning the, it's the beginning days of persecution in the middle 60s. He writes his epistle around 65 or 67. And he says, beloved, think it not strange for the, about the fiery trials which are come to try thee as though some strange thing happened unto you. So if you be reproached, well rejoice, he says, inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings. So that uh, when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Amen. On your part, he is evil spoken of, but on his, your, uh, he is glorified. So, of course, it continues after the uh, first three centuries. There is a, well, an abridgment. Um, Constantine becomes the self-styled uh, ruler of the Western world. Uh, he's an opportunist. And he, even though the Catholics have canonized him as Saint Constantine, I kind of, I don't know about that at all. He said, they saw the cross in the heavens and God said, in this sign, conquer. Take your sword and slaughter people. Doesn't sound like the Lord to me, but that's what he claimed. And he brought the Christians out of hiding and gave them respite. They were allowed to come out. They could now use the pagan temples and they could use those temples as churches and meeting places. They never had to fear persecution again and the church became complacent and became organized and became uh, a second Roman Empire. And uh, the Pope became the Caesar and they even used the same buildings on the Capitoline in Rome. <laughs> so, so it was more of a compromise. I said at the end of that little video there, you know, I, there was a worse challenge coming after the days of the church at Smyrna. That they, it was to be the church at Pergamos, married to the world. Paganism and Christianity blended together in this strange form of mysticism and Roman Catholicism. So, of course, uh, godly people rise up against it. They want to be free men. And so they rise up in Reformation, and uh, there was great persecution. Uh, Fifty million people were brought into the Inquisition, where the Catholics uh, made you pledge allegiance to the Pope. And uh, if not, you would be 
stretched on the rack and then burned at the stake. But it exists today. We still have Christians persecuted worldwide. 360 million reports of that persecution. Christians have been killed. Last year it was 5,898 Christians martyred for the faith. Churches and related buildings attacked 5,110. Christians arrested and imprisoned 6,175. And Christians even kidnapped 3,820 through the various, uh, various nations. Here's a little clip on this. In Colombia, Rolo delivers Bibles and shares the gospel in guerrilla-controlled areas. Every time he leaves, he knows it's possible he will never come back. In Iran, Mariam smuggles Bibles to desperate Christians who have never owned their own copy of God's Word. In Nigeria, Elizabeth and her five children are now on their own because her husband was brutally murdered for his Christian witness. And in China, Wang Yi is serving nine years in prison. His crime? Leading an unregistered church. These are just a few of the millions of persecuted Christians living and serving in the world's most dangerous places to follow Christ. He promised that his followers would be persecuted, and we are committed to serving them. For more than 50 years, the voice of the martyrs has served these bold and courageous believers by offering direct help when they face persecution, delivering Bibles to believers at any cost, and equipping frontline workers to advance the gospel. VOM also tells the stories of our persecuted brothers and sisters, which inspire other believers to pray and advance the gospel where they are. The Bible tells us to remember the prisoner as if you were in prison with them. And when one part of the body suffers, other parts of the body suffer with them. Join this global movement to support our persecuted Christian family around the world. Find out more at vom.org. So um, you all have a little opportunity next week. So if you put a little extra money in uh, the cupcake fund, you'll be, uh, it'll all be going straight here to that particular uh, mission. There's other missions and so forth, open doors, and uh, they're, they're all doing about the same thing, and that is seeing what they can do to ameliorate the sufferings of Christians in other countries. Uh, again, this is so foreign to us in America, but it is a, uh, it is a reality in these various nations that oppress Christianity. So, so do what you can next week, obviously, and if you want to continue to invest in, in that sort of a missionary uh, outreach, I think it uh, is well used. So, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we've ended the Beatitudes at this point, which was, was Jesus' way of introducing us into this Sermon on the Mount and the concept of the glorious kingdom that would be ours. But right after this, uh, he gives a stinging rebuke to the state of believers and what, what ultimately happened to the believers, even in the first century. They would lose their first love. It is our problem. Uh, it's a common problem amongst Christians, and that is that after we are first saved, we are excited for the Lord. We want to serve God. We want to give witness to what Christ has done in our life. And uh, we have an exuberance. And wherever we go, we want to give forth the glad tidings. Of course, then we face maybe a little uh, rebuff and, and persecution of some kind. People don't want to hear it. Family members say, keep it to yourself. And, and, and after a while, we begin shutting up. And we don't want to cause this kind of persecution, I suppose. And then we recoil into the background, into the shadows. And the world is just, uh, in most cases right now, they're fine with you just keep it to yourself. But uh, they won't be fine with that for very long either. So Jesus warns us, ye are the salt of the earth. Amen. The great preserving elements of salt and what salt will do, obviously. So ye are the salt of the earth. Uh, this is what they would use, of course, for meats. Uh, this is in a day where there was no refrigeration, so they would use it to preserve Salt is a preserving element, and thus the metaphor is that believers are the preserving element of the world, of the earth. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, 
doesn't have any strength to preserve any longer, so it's weakened. Wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. It's a stinging rebuke. The church will become apathetic, inert. Its evangelism will be effect. Its theology will be uh, weak. And when the church gets to this level, it's time to call the church out of here. Now, I base all this on a number of passages. This is in Revelation chapter 3, which is the last stage of these seven churches. It seems to me it is the epoch of time. And so we have the church at Laodicea. It's described here as, I, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Uh, I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, lukewarm water is an emetic. It's given to people to induce vomiting. This is a disgusting image, isn't it? We have the Lord spitting this church out of his mouth because it disgusts him. Are we in the church of Laodicea? Is this the age of the church of the lukewarm? Well, I wouldn't have to go very far, I think, uh, to prove this point. What I hear, mostly what I hear, is pretty disgusting. Uh, if you want to consider that the gospel, it is such a weak... And then we've got this, these crazy churches have rock and roll going on. Devil music in the church. I have to say, you know, I was preaching there at the Teen Challenge, and, and they, they wanted to do two worship songs before I preached. I said, what? fine. And they put a video up. I don't know what these people were screaming. I have no idea what they were saying. A woman up there, you know, with a t-shirt on and tight pants, and she's screaming into a microphone. I don't know what she's saying. And everybody's got their arms waving and so forth, and I think, this, is, what, this doesn't edify anybody, I'm thinking. To me, I hail back to my rock and roll days. This is like a rock concert. That's how I looked at it. Everybody waving back and forth, their hands up and so forth. I mean, they don't have the devil horns up, but they have their hands waving and so forth. They pick it up from the world. It's all about the world. It's lukewarm. I, I believe God will spit it out of his mouth. Disgusting. Now, people will come here to church and say, well, you play these old-fashioned hymns and so forth. Now, li listen, I'm going to tell you what. When I first got saved, I thought, man, this is the corniest music there is. Because I, well, I was a professional musician and I was playing nightclubs and whatever else and worldly music pretty much and to me this was cornball music this was right up there with rock rock and roll well it, it was right up there with uh, rockabilly um, country western music I, I couldn't stand that either and um, I said this is so corny and then I started joining in I, I actually took the hymn book up and I started singing the hymns I started reading these words. They were all scriptural thoughts and were melting my heart. And little by little, I fell in love with God's music. And uh, when we're on fire for the Lord, music is a wonderful um, means of exciting the spirit. So at any rate, we have a lukewarm church today. I'm afraid I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want Ichabod written over this church. We want the blessings of God, the full blessings of God. Amen. So uh, we're not going uh, to chime in with what the world's doing. <laughs> William MacDonald, um, he was a uh, Plymouth Brethren and uh, wrote a number of books, True Discipleship, convicting, very convicting book. Don't read this book unless you want to be troubled. Um, it, it won't really permit uh, any false fellowship. He demands true discipleship. Really denying yourself, taking up the cross, following. He says, a disciple can be forgiven if he does not have great mental ability. That's a good thing, right? All of us, right? We're all happy. He can be forgiven also if he does not display outstanding physical prowess. But no disciple can be excused if he does not have zeal if his heart is not aflame 
with a red-hot passion for the Savior, he stands condemned. After all, Christians are followers of the one who said, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Their Savior was consumed with a passion for God and for his interests. There is no room in his train for half-hearted followers. You can read the rest of this. That's easy to copy. Did you get it? Okay. I thought so. C.T. Studd, he's a... <laughs> He was a cricketer, so you understand that. He was um, in England at the time. Cricket was football, what football is in America now. So it was the chief delight. And this man was an, the top cricketer in England. And uh, he could have gone on to many different uh, professions from there. But he got saved. His father got saved first. Her D.L. Moody, an uneducated, unordained preacher of the gospel. I don't know, do you know the story of D.L. Moody? I mean, it's really an amazing story. He was a shoe salesman. So really, he always did have an interest in souls. But, um, okay, see, it ripples back. Eventually, people in the back row will get it. But, so... D.L. Moody got saved. Uh, his Sunday school teacher, you know, got him aside and told him uh, the world is yet to see what would happen if one man was totally given over to God. And uh, that, was, that was it for D.L. Moody. He said, I'll, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. And he went out and uh, preached. Thousands of people would assemble to hear him preach. And C.T. Studd's father got saved. He was a, uh, a wealthy man, lived in mansion and so on and uh, gave a lot of his fortune away. And C.T. ultimately came under conviction, got saved as well. Be gave up everything, took the fortune that he inherited from his father, divided it in three ways. Third went to Hudson Taylor, a third went to William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, and a third to George Mueller and his orphanages. And Studd said, I'm starting off with nothing, believing that God will raise support. And so he uh, becomes a missionary to three continents. He goes to Africa, he goes to Asia, goes to India, preaches in all three places. Dies uh, because uh, of an asthma uh, attack. He's in the jungles after all. And uh, he dies with shouting, hallelujah. That's how he died. Wouldn't you like to die that way? Hallelujah, he, he, he cries. But as far as zeal is concerned, he said, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. It was Wesley that said, give me a hundred men who love God with all their hearts and fear nothing but sin, and I will move the world. Jim Elliott, who preached to the Aka Indians, um, if you know his story, it's uh, quite a challenge. Uh, he and Nate Saint and uh, two others went and decided they would reach an unreachable tribe, the Aka Indians, who were uh, cannibals, essentially. And uh, they went to, uh, to make contact with them, and they flew over, you know, and they dropped presents and so on. And they decided one day we're gonna actually land our plane and we're gonna make contact, and hopefully now they realize that we're coming in peace and so on. They landed the plane, as soon as they got out of the plane, they were slaughtered. So they never even got the chance to preach to the Aka Indians. His wife and the others went back and continued the, the mission to the Aka Indians and actually reached the people that killed their husbands and uh, brought them to Christ. It was he that wrote, He maketh his ministers a flame of fire. Am I ignitable? Will God deliver me from the dread asbestos of other things? Saturate me with the oil of the, script, of the Spirit that I may be a, a flame. But flame is transient, often short-lived, Canst thou bear this, my soul? Short life? In me there dwells the spirit of the great short-lived, whose zeal for God's house consumed him. Make me thy fuel, O flame of God. This he wrote in his diary the week before he was martyred. That last line he takes from a poem by Amy Carmichael. 
from prayer that asks that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on thee, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from silken self, O captain free, thy soldier who would follow thee, from subtle love of softening things, from easy choices weakenings, not thus our spirits fortified, not this way went the crucified, from all that dims thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me, Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. J.C. Ryle writes, A zealous man in religion is preeminently a man of one thing, it's not enough to say that he is earnest, hearty, uncompromising, thoroughgoing, wholehearted, fervent in spirit. He only sees one thing. He cares for one thing. He lives for one thing. He is swallowed up in one thing, and that one thing is to please God. Whether he lives or whether he dies, whether he's rich or whether he's poor, whether he pleases men or whether he gives offense, whether he is thought wise or whether he's considered a fool. Whether he gets blame or whether he gets shame, for all this, the zealous man cares nothing at all. He burns for one thing, and that one thing is to please God and to advance God's glory. If he is consumed in the way and very burning, he cares not for it. He is content. He feels like a lamp. He is made to burn. And if consumed in burning, he has but done the work for which God appointed him. Such an one will always find a sphere for his zeal. If he cannot preach and work and give money, he will cry and sigh and pray. Yes, if he is only a pauper or on a perpetual bed of sickness, he will make the wheels of sin around him drive heavily by continually interceding against it. If he cannot fight in the valley with Joshua, he will do the work of Moses Aaron and her on the hill. If he is cut off from working himself, he will give the Lord no rest till help is raised up from another quarter and the work is done. This is what I mean when I speak of zeal in religion. So if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's thenceforth good for nothing. What I want to be categorized as a Christian that was good for nothing, I should hope not. We're going to have to put God's concerns first in our lives. We're moving almost as a crescendo to the sixth chapter in the 33rd verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. The kingdom first. Reaching souls for the kingdom. Teaching the good gospel. Reforming lives. Regenerating lives through the power of the word of God. This is what we must live for as believers. Elsewise, it would make perfect sense to me that after we were saved, that God would immediately take us to heaven. But he left us here and he said, so send I you. You will go in my place. And give out the good words of God. Hallelujah. You know, I wanted to mention that thanks to uh, John Slivka and Linda Slivka, we have a bunch of tracks now on the track rack. <laughs> and um, so take those tracks with you. And uh, don't waste them now. But make sure you hand them to somebody. And say to them, if you get an opportunity, read this. You know, it will bless your life. It's all about how to get to heaven. So all of us can be a witness. Most people say, well, I don't know much about the Bible. Well, anybody can hand a tract to somebody and say, this changed my life. It may change yours. You'd be surprised at how many people are out there that are actually looking for something. They're looking for something in the wrong directions, but they're looking for something that will deeply satisfy the urgings of the soul. And that can only be found in Christ, my friend. So ye are the salt of the earth. Lord, help us to be salt 
that means that we stand against the devil and we preserve against the evil of this generation. Now the devil seems to really be the god of this world as the Bible says that he would be. Seems like the multitude is going the, the lost direction. We understand all of this. It has always been that case. Christians have always been the minority. True Christians. They'll tell us that there are two billion Christians in the world, but a lot of them that call themselves Christians are not really Christians at all. In name only, not with heart. God wants us to be the restraining factor, the restraining force. We'll see you tonight part two of this but I want to teach tonight about the restraining power of the Holy Spirit Amen. the fact that the Bible tells us he who now letteth or restrains will let or restrains God is keeping back evil through the force of his church and his people Amen. he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way Amen. that's the rapture of the church Amen. then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his mouth. So God is going to come back and destroy Antichrist right after the rapture of the church. So the, the church now is holding him back. I've said it before, I feel pretty powerful. You say, how's that? I'm in the devil's way. I like to stand in his way. I like to stand here and say, here and no further. Amen. Believe it or not, that's what the church is doing. It could be much worse, beloved. It's hard to imagine, but it could be much worse. The devil will keep advancing as the church keeps losing its saltness, its preserving element until none of it is left and the church is good for nothing. Let's pray. Now, first and foremost, you need to be saved. You need to give your heart to Jesus. You need to escape the damnation of hell. You need to trust the finished work of our loving Savior who took all of your sins and nailed them to the cross because he loved you. You need to give your life to him. You need to promise to follow him. Don't worry. He'll lead you into pleasant places. He'll fill you with what the world could never give you. Some of you so frustrated, so upset the world itself has you in a tizzy. God said, I'll give you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's what everybody's looking for. The nine fruits of the Holy Ghost. Receive them today. If you're not living in the power and force of that, then come and repent. Come to the altar and say, Lord, I, I can be better. I want to be better. I admit that I'm savorless salt. Change me, O God. Make me thy fuel, O flame of God. Let us be on fire for the thing which counts, that will matter for eternity. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ shall last. We'll need the power of God to raise our families in this insane world of ours. We need his instructions. He'll tell us what to do. The Bible is your instruction manual. You need to know it, love it, and live it. You need to put it in your heart and memorize it. God will bring forth great fruit and blessing in your life and your family's life. And so let us stand quietly just for a moment longer. And if you're in need to come to this altar this morning, Holy Spirit is pressing upon you, then come here immediately. Just leave your seat wherever it is. If somebody's in the way, they'll move out of the way. And get here to the altar and kneel down and seek the Lord while he may be found. This is a day that he's speaking to you. Respond to him. Believe him. Lord, everybody in this room has loved lost ones. They're beloved in our heart. We pray for them every day. And Lord, we're looking for opportunities to give out that gospel to them, to show them the way, the truth, and the life.
before they die, Lord. Oh, help us, Lord. Give us what we need to make that impact. And Lord, even upon those that perhaps even at first reject us, let us be confident that thy word will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing wherein thou hast sent it. May it be so every time we open the word, every time we preach that word, may it have its full effect upon the lives that hear it. May faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God be established in every heart. We leave here, Lord, now with confidence and hopefully with your great blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. And you can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come in to stay, come in to